Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This and welcome to the Finos Open Source and Fintech Podcast. I'm your host, Grizz Griswold, Marketing Manager for Finos. And today we're going to do an informal, non rehearsed chat about Finos and also about Gabriel Colombo, who is the Executive Director of Finos. Gab, say hi. Hi, Grizz. An amazing pronunciation. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, I, I try. I've been around you for about three years now, and, and my Italian accent is not perfect, and I'm probably going to get crap for it, but, uh, uh, but <laughs> you that's okay. You and I got to say, I'm surprised you, you haven't come up with uh, any of the swear words that you probably hear from me pretty often. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, uh, this is supposed to be a safe for work podcast, so uh, uh, I will save those for internal meetings only. <laughs> Good call. Good call. Okay. Okay. Um, so while this is informal, while this is unrehearsed, um, I, I do have a couple of questions, but I mean, they're, they're very general broad um, because we want to get to know you a little bit as a human. Um, I like humans. I like good humans. Um, you are one. So uh, let's talk about that. Let's talk a little bit about, about Finos. We might talk about um, kind of with the end in mind, what, you know, what, what is Finos and how does it, you know, associate and what should it do um, for, you know, all the people involved, all the companies involved, all the, um, you know, um, and, you know, but let's just, let's just talk. Um, so a little bit about Gabriel Colombo. I'm bad. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so Grizz, I mean, as uh, I think he's spoiled already by now, I am Italian uh, and uh, yes. certainly permeates uh, uh, around a lot of many things I do. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a, as a, you know, from a professional standpoint, I am a born and bred uh, computer engineer. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up in the what I would call the open source gold rush era. Uh, um, I've had the luck to, you know, always, pretty much always work for, for open source companies or participate in open source communities. Um, and I think that has certainly shaped, um, you know, the way I look at software, the way I look about, you know, the opportunities that uh, collaboration can bring. I, you know, certainly always been in my life, uh, I like to think I'm a pretty collaborative person, um, mm -hmm. and I'm, uh, 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 I appreciate. I'm agreeing it. with you, boss. I'm agreeing with you, okay, boss, great, right great, now. Great, mm -hmm. great. Yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I um, spent the first twenty years of my life in Italy, uh, pretty much all over the place between Rome, Sicily. Uh, um, you know, learning. Um, to fight for pretty much anything you want to achieve. You know, Italy mm -hmm. is an amazing country, but, you know, it takes um, some real ambition and real uh, uh, grit to, yeah. to, you know, make it in a way. Uh, and then I uh, um, moved to Amsterdam when I was 23. I, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had dreadlocks at the time, so people- I have seen pictures. <laughs> and 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 I'm probably going to post that if in, in the blog post that we do for this, just <laughs> FYI. With a <laughs> or, or, huh? yes, yes, yes. It's, called, extortion, it's, is, you know? it's extortion blackmail. That's um great, this great, isn't being great. recorded, is We're it? We're very Go familiar ahead. with that. <laughs> so um yeah, I you know, when I when I moved to, to Holland for my first um, you know, open source consulting job, you know. Mm -hmm. Clearly, with dreadlocks, people had uh, some hard time believing that I was there for work. Um, That's fair. <laughs> but uh, that that really changed my career, and, and really, that was um, you know pretty much the first uh, um, I would say real experience in open source, um, and just sort of seeing how even a small geographic. Uh, uh, distance. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, <coughs> you know, Italy and Holland are, are relatively close, especially if you look at from from the U.S. standpoint. Right. But I remember when when we moved to Holland, and that was two thousand seven, uh, 
almost 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. I remember one of the craziest thing was um, there was a, a, a mandate from the queen of Holland that all public tenders would have to be uh, fulfilled by open source software. Uh, mm-hmm. Otherwise, a strong justification should have been provided by any you know, public entity that was not going with open source. And that for me, again, this is 2007, that's like 15 years ago. And we're talking government, we're not talking, you know, private sector. So it was already amazing to me to see, wait, you know, in Italy, open source at that time was still pretty small, still pretty niche, you know, seeing how, you know, a modern, a a bit more modern technology uh, centric country like Holland was already promoting this was was very high opening and, you know, leaving aside the fact that I had my questions, whether the queen, you know, bless her heart, (laughs) Uh, how much, you know, she knew about the insights of open source, but it was certainly, certainly amazing. Uh, And then from there, uh, you know, I spent seven years in Holland and and then moved to the United States. Um, You know, who knew I would have found uh, uh, my better half uh, in in the deep south in Georgia. Uh, uh, And so I moved to Atlanta in 2013. Um, still working for a company called Alfresco, open source content management, uh, and the rest is history. Uh, two more years in Atlanta, and then we moved uh, here in San Francisco uh, when I took the job uh, to run Finos. Uh, so hopefully a little bit of an intro here. Yeah, and that's um, that also explains why you said uh, about the queen, bless her heart, because that is definitely a southern um, term for sure. Uh, <laughs> we joked about that before. Venture, I'm not going to venture into the yalls. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know yes. if you want to hear that with an Italian accent. Yeah. Well, <laughs> go for it. Y'all. All y'all. All y'all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, Talking with Christine, um, uh, God, how long ago was that now? Um, a couple of years ago. Um, she was telling me how, what, you guys were in Alpharetta? Uh, or near she Alpharetta. Used to, she used to live there. Yeah. She was, yeah, yeah. She said that, uh, yeah, Gab, you know, came into town and met everybody, and and everybody in town were like, "Who's that Italian guy?" And who's speaking? Yeah, it was speaking a Italian bit... with Southern accent, and you know, going to Chick Fil A every day. Look, Chick Fil A. <laughs> Let's not go there. Let's not go there. Uh, that's a, that's one, another podcast. One of the, yeah, exactly. We might have to end this early. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it was a little bit of a culture shock to move from Amsterdam to Atlanta. You know, I don't deny that. And uh, sure. I have a pretty funny anecdote there. Um, is I it remember, safe for work? Yeah, it is. It is. Okay, okay, okay. Um, thank you for checking. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember one of the first time I flew. I wasn't living in Am- in Atlanta yet, but I flew to see Christine, my wife, my now wife, mm-hmm. um, and the flight landed pretty late at you know Hartsfield Jackson, um, probably two a.m. and I was crazy hungry. So Christine picked me up, and you know uh, we tried to find a place. Of course, it was two a.m. She lives in the suburbs, so there wasn't right. a whole lot open. Mm-hmm. But we found a Waffle House. Uh, uh, that was my first experience with the Waffle House, which of course is a you know is a southern landmark in in many yes. ways. Yes, and <laughs> I remember you, you can't just 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 so anybody who's listening has never been to a Waffle House. I know that they are open twenty four hours, but I can't say that until maybe until the age of forty that I'd ever been there um, <laughs> during the day. Um, <laughs> Then I had kids, and then we've gone during the day. But but um, your your normal time to go to to Waffle House is eleven p.m. until four a.m. I believe. So uh, so yes, very very appropriate. Um, so I remember sitting in and ordering drinks. So the waiter the the waitress come and, and asked us for drinks, and and you know as a proper Italian, my answer was like, "Do you guys have sparkling water?" Um, <laughs> The waitress looked at my my fiance at the time and she's like, Did you just ask for sparkling water? And they start cracking themselves up. Mm-hmm. And that was my first sort of understanding that, you know, 
sparkling water is a luxury good here. Uh, rather <laughs> than something that yes. you can actually order at the waffle house. Yeah, <laughs> an example of cultural differences that, that yeah. I learned. Do they there. offer you a Sprite at that point? Yes. Exactly. Yes, we have yes. sodas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so uh, we're in San Francisco and uh, uh, Finos was not Finos at that time. So um, let, let's talk maybe a little bit about if you want to go into any history of Finos um, and what Finos does, all of the above. Um, but again, feel free to go any direction on this. Yeah, I mean, it was a, I, I, in 2015, I did a talk at ApacheCon on cloud and open source, um, you know, starting from the, I would say, false hypothesis that cloud was going to kill the open source movement because, mm. you know, you're not selling software anymore with a SaaS model, you are delivering a service to your customers. And so, you know, why does it matter uh, whether the actual underlying software is open source? But, you know, by the end of the talk, the whole trend, the whole sort of hypothesis that I wanted to prove is that, you know, cloud would not exist without open source. Um, you know, if you think about it, you know, all the, uh, virtualization software that the cloud is run on, uh, the operating systems that that uh, are you know efficiently scaled in cloud, um, you know most of the application framework uh, that at that time were offered through PaaS platform as a service. You know, remember when that was a thing? Yeah. Um, all of those were open source, and you know on the flip side, SaaS and cloud did indeed open a you know, very interesting new way of commercializing open source. So, you know, by the end of the talk, again, the idea was uh, it's cloud plus open source and cloud mm -hmm. would not exist without open source. Um, you know, as usual, when you do this type of talks, you have a little bit of imposter syndrome, um, but turns out that the talk was very successful because just a couple of weeks later, an executive recruiter reached out um, with this opportunity around the Symfony Software Foundation. Um, you know, he reached out and he said, look, we got uh, all these major investment banks, you know, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, uh, uh, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, uh, and also buy side firms like BlackRock, Citadel. Um, mm -hmm. They all want to collaborate together in cloud. And I was like, are you? Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, <laughs> really, that was my reaction. And then it was like, right. wait, but it's not all. They also are creating an open source foundation um, to collaborate in the open. And I was like, dude, like pinch me. Uh, I right. must be dreaming. Uh, you know, like uh, in 15 years of open source or 20 years by now, man, I'm old. Um, you know, financial services has been historically one of the one one of the industries that you know has lagged in. Yeah. You know not only adoption of open source, but it really just cultural uh, myths, uh, uh, you know, not yet debunked in that industry. And so, True. look, I went through that. Uh, I went through the interview process. I, I interviewed with several of these executives at, at um, these organizations. And well, you know, that was an actual real opportunity. We, I knew it was <laughs> a, you know, a big challenge, of course, but, um, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, being lucky enough to, to being given the job. And so in uh, December 2015, I uh, got the job. Two months later, I moved out of Atlanta here into San Francisco, where mm -hmm. Symphony, uh, the commercial entity, was uh, um, based. Um, and, you know, a new chapter started. Uh, so, so, wait, wait, wait. We've got to, of course, go back just a, a little bit. When did you cut the dreads? <laughs> that was much earlier, man. I oh, okay, okay, okay. Grew up with. Uh, uh, we used to tease each other in school, uh, at middle school or high school, uh -huh. about how we were gonna lose our hair early. I mean, that's such a weird thing, you know. At high school, making right. fun of each other for losing the, our hair, and so, you know, after a few years of dress, that's probably when I was twenty-four, twenty-five. 
I started, you know, looking at my hairline and like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Eating, am I, am I balding? And so that was actually, you know, you might the think it was professional reasons why I cut my dreadlocks, but completely, you know, untrue. <laughs> it's actually because I was scared of losing my hair. And now I'm happy to report that uh-huh. you still have hair. I still have enough hair. So yeah, I, <laughs> it I all worked out. Cleaned up guy when I moved to the, <laughs> to the United States. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay, so so you're there, Symphony yeah. Software Foundation, in San Francisco. I'm in San and, Francisco. I'm and how? There. Wait, wait, wait. What? So, so, you know, I, my background, you already know, is is in events and and design and developer events, but also open soft open source software events. And and you know, ten years ago, twelve years ago, when I first started, it was more about like you know, rah, rah, open source, because, because it was still not in the mainstream. People consumed it, but people didn't necessarily know how to contribute. Um, uh, I, I, GitHub, when I first started uh, doing events, that Qu- Chris Wanstrath came to one of our first events in Columbia, South Carolina, because like, he could, uh, first of all, but, but, you know, and put a thousand dollars behind the bar, and that was how they did their marketing at GitHub back in. Oh man, was that 2012 or something like that? I'm not quite sure. Um, so, so that's how long I've been doing it, and then it started to turn into, you know, no longer raw, raw open source. It was like, okay, here's what we're actually doing, and so, so how crazy was it? you know, looking back at, you know, you've already said a little bit about financial services lagging, but like, that's got to be a monumental task just to get that idea into a community that, you know, first is regulated, right? Um, And second, you know, probably doesn't want to work with each other, not only because of the regulated part, um, because they can't in some instances, but also because, you know, they're dealing with you know stocks and they're dealing with their own stocks and they're dealing with you know having to make money um you know against their competition so why would i ever work with you you know and and they're at they're the forefront of you know obviously financial services but you know they're on top of everything else that's already being traded i guess um so how crazy is that well, it was pretty crazy, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, in some ways, you know, I would say we were a little early, um, you know, in the uh, movement that we're now seeing really being uh, taking over uh, financial services in, in 2020 and 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I first joined, um, look, first of all, I had the luck of inheriting an already formed, uh, very senior board of executives from nice. these institutions, and really a sort of true broad representation of the industry, not just you know sell side uh, and banks uh, like the ones I mentioned before. Uh, you know, probably ten of the top twelve American investment banks, uh, several banks in Europe. Uh, but we also had buy side representation, uh, mm-hmm. said BlackRock and Citadel. We also had vendors, um, data vendors, Standard and Poor's, Taxit, uh, uh, IHS Market has been one of the earliest contributors to the foundation. And so, you know, I gotta give it, you know, to the Symphony folks to having created this really, um, you know, who's who type of representation in our board, you know, mm-hmm. and as well. You know, I had funding. The the when I uh, uh, started as the executive director of the Symphony Software Foundation, you know, there was already funding in in the foundation at least for you know uh, uh, one or two years to be able to you know structure the team and and the operations. So that certainly is one of the factors that you know made it a little bit more feasible in my mind when. Mm-hmm. We, you know, when I took the job, um, and I gotta say, I was, you know, relatively new. Uh, this is my first chief executive uh, um, job, and so, you know, 
I think it was a combination of yes, there are some we have really a good thing going uh, already there, ready to be exploited, uh, you know, for the good of the industry. Right. Um, I certainly had a little bit of, um, you know, uh, I would say ingenuity in 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 a way that, um, you know. I've always went after big challenges in my life. And so this was a certainly a big challenge that, that um, I thought it was really worth. Um, this is an industry that, again, has so much more potential for improvement and, and better collaboration and efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to go into rants on uh, <laughs> you know, our daily experiences. Um, sending money across the US, we can talk about that later, uh, coming from Europe. Um, but um, yes, you're absolutely right. When I first joined, um, you know, these are fierce competitors. Mm -hmm. And I think one element that really helped uh, um, sort of breaking the deadlock, if you want, uh, it's really the fact that I didn't come from the industry. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't have any previous allegiances with any of these organizations. Right. Um, you know, as much as this organization has tens of thousands of folks, it is actually a pretty small circle. You see folks moving from, you know, come the, the, the first bank to another and, right. and so on and so forth. And so the fact that I, I wasn't an ex Goldman guy or an ex JP Morgan guy or an ex city guy definitely sort of helped creating that sort of baseline of trust uh, mm -hmm. to build upon. Uh, right. You know, I don't deny that in the first, you know, six months, uh, at least, most of the questions that I was getting were, you know, pretty, um, I would say pretty inappropriate in terms of as an executive director of a nonprofit, you mm -hmm. know, competitors would, would try to sort of grasp information from me as to what other players were doing and what, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, um, we won't name names we're doing within the foundation which is of course exactly <laughs> right. all that i'm not supposed to talk about uh, right. being trusted of pretty pretty important information there um but the good news is that that phase really lasted you know about six months to mm -hmm. a year i would say yeah. um you know already by the beginning of 2017 um uh, we had an established community around symphony uh, the trust was established with, between us and uh, uh, the banks and increasingly between the banks themselves. And I think, look, Chris, the, if you think about financial services, it is a very different industry than other sort of tech industries that, that, that I come yeah. from, that I was used to. You know, if you even just think about a trade and how many entities and organizations are involved in the completion of a single trade from sort of pre-trade operations to the actual trading, to clearing, to settlement. Uh, uh, like it is an industry that must collaborate in uh, a certain way to just run their business, you know, completely right. from, you know, a Facebook or a Google, you know, you have a service, you offer it to your customers, they buy it or they don't buy it. You know, it's pretty much all in your hands as a single entity. Yeah, sure, you can decide to partner with others, but generally you're sort of master of your own destiny. When I think about financial services, I think about a highly interconnected uh, network of, yeah, as you say, competitors, but also companies that have to collaborate to be successful. And so I think that was really the premise why I was like, look, yes, it might be hard. It might be a big challenge, but it does indeed make sense. There is a way that, you know, we can collaborate on common standards, common pieces of code, common uh, APIs, and that is going to benefit each and everyone uh, in the industry. And I have right. to say, hopefully, the average Joe downstream uh, uh, that uses the, the financial uh, services complex. Right. So, well, yeah. I, I mean, should, shouldn't it ulti shouldn't it ultimately be for the customers and clients of these banks? You know, whether it's on you know, the trading floor or on, I guess, retail with you know, with banking in general. You know, I go to the bank and 
I write a check, which I don't. Um, <laughs> um, but it it should filter down to where those end users, the customers, should actually have an easier time doing a transaction. Just one transaction, whether that's a trade or or at the ATM, um, you know. But it but but it all starts way back here with, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, many companies at once being involved in one single transaction. So, yeah. No, so, uh, and, and, you know, I come from a place that, look, Italy and Europe have so many issues. Uh, we you know, <laughs> dedicate a whole other podcast to that. But, you know, I come from a place where, especially having lived for many years in Holland, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can send money to any country in Europe in minutes uh, right. without, you know, a Zelle or a Venmo or a FinTech sort of bridging that gap. And right. the reason is that there is an international banking standard uh, called IBAN uh, that allows to do that. Um, you know, talking about anecdotes, my wife was the one that literally at, I think, 33 years old, she taught me how to fill a check. I had never seen a check in my life. <laughs> I think my dad filled it when I was like five. But checks right. are not a thing uh, uh, in Europe, you know, in the era of credit card, in the era of digital payments. So, you know, I think part of the drive, knowing that this was a big challenge, was really the fact that, yes, I have seen uh, a better model, again, with all the caveats of the world, knowing that there are many other complexities with Europe and, you know, uh, uh, the, the single currency, as, as we're seeing, you know, a lot of challenges, uh, um, a lot of countries challenging that model. Think about Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think having been exposed growing up to a model which I found, you know, better for the ultimate end user, uh, was another, you know, motivator, I think, for me to, to sort of take on this challenge. Cool. Cool. So Symphony Software Foundation gets started. You get in there. Um, things are starting to normalize a little bit, um, but we're no longer called the Symphony Software Foundation, right? So what happened? Well, that's... Uh... I think probably the most exciting part of, of uh, the story. I mean, um, after a year working together with, um, you know, this, this very influential board, and, you know, I have to say very, not only very smart and very senior folks, but, um, you know, I think we build a relationship that goes beyond uh, uh, professional. Um, I am a big fan of, uh, you know, it not being just work uh, when you when you look back. Um, and I think actually that was a fundamental uh, sort of superpower that uh, uh, our foundation has, has, you know, achieved or, or has uh, developed. Mm -hmm. um, but by mid-2017, um, we started having conversations on, you know, the broader opportunity that we were seeing in the industry. Um, you know, the fintech wave was growing and was hot in the media. Uh, you know, potentially starting chipping away at uh, the very business of, of several of these institutions. Um, decentralized technologies like blockchain, uh, mm -hmm. where even further uh, uh, sort of defining a complete new model of carrying out financial transactions. Um, you know, the, the industry was undergoing a major, and it still is, candidly, undergoing a major talent crunch. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this East Coast, West Coast uh, hate, love relationship, um, but clearly, you know, a lot of the best talent was, was, you know, choosing to go work for technology companies. And, right. you know, as an open source guy, I can definitely uh, see a correlation between, you know, 
being allowed to continue foster your individual portfolio by contributing to open source, you know, as a major um, factor in the choice of your next job. Mm -hmm. uh, even further, I would say for the newer generations, I mean, turns out that I am a millennial because I'm from 1981. So I'm really yeah, you're a baby. Close. You're a baby uh, to me. <laughs> but, you know, especially Gen Z, uh, um, you know, they come into the, the workforce, they start coming into the workforce, um, you know, with clear demands about making an impact, about mm -hmm. what are you doing to give back? And, you know, while, let's be clear, uh, um, open source is not charity. Um, there definitely is a conscience aspect to information sharing and you know open collaboration uh, that yeah. had a really strong appeal on especially the newer generations. And so, you know, the environment was fertile to think about expanding our foundation into what it is today, the FinTech Open Source Foundation, um, really an organization that could provide, uh, uh, you know, an independent forum, a trusted umbrella, uh, for any type of open source and open standard collaboration in the industry. And, right. you know, I'm not going to say it was easy, um, you know, mm -hmm. when you have uh, to rally up, um, you know, about 22 board members on a super majority vote. I guess right. I realized why I've always been so much into politics in my life. Uh, um, <laughs> There certainly was, you know, um, a lot of conversations to be had, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of um, consensus building to be done. Uh, but in January 2018, we took the leap and we uh, uh, approved the motion to expand into Finos. Mm -hmm. uh, and then three months later, we had an amazing launch event uh, at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. Right. Uh, where we announced the FinTech Open Source Foundation. And, you know, that was really the turning point for us. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> trying to think of where to go next, because um, we could keep going forward on that. Um, what about you going, uh, we, we talked about you leading up to this, um, was there anything you want to talk about during that time too? Well, look, that has been, you know, when I mentioned the um, sort of beyond professional relationship with my board, um, you know, that, that period uh, was a pretty, you know, complex uh, period in my personal life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, one of the areas where um, the support from our board has been, you know, candidly fundamental. Um, as we were going through the process of, you know, pivoting and expanding the foundation, um, you know, I had my first son, Leonardo, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we knew he had a congenital heart defect, uh, mm -hmm. um, but when we, when he was born, you know, we also discovered they had uh, some pretty unique uh, uh, chromosomal issues. You know, every every parent like to say that their kid is is one of a kind. Right. Uh, in this case, it actually really? is one of a kind. <laughs> There's literally uh, no other case uh, reported in literature of this specific chromosomal pattern. Um, and so we had a pretty rough start. Uh, you had a pretty rough start for the first three months, uh, three to six months. We spent most of our time in the hospital and that was late 2017, exactly as we were carrying out this uh, pretty big lift of, of pivoting the foundation. Right. Uh, and I still remember, you know, uh, in one of the darkest times in the hospital, uh, um, you know, getting a call from one of my board members, which I'm you know, not going to mention for, for privacy, but you know, uh, I remember them telling me, Gab, you do what you need to do. We'll mm -hmm. take care of business. Um, and they did indeed actively took, you know, a massive 
role in you know, dealing with some of the politics that, of course, is involved in uh, bringing you know, 20 different companies together right. uh, uh, and create consensus there. Um, and so, you know, uh, that, of course, has been, you know, a major turning point in my life, not just from a professional standpoint, but from a, you know, a personal standpoint. Mm-hmm. And in a way, something that has really, uh, you know, put things in perspective for me. Um, I am a very driven person. Uh, as you probably know, I'm also a very uh, requiring person uh, in terms mm-hmm. of professionalism, in terms of, um, you know, delivering always an outstanding uh, uh, service to our members, to our customers, and to the industry. Um, mm-hmm. But clearly, uh, you know, there are different orders of challenges uh, that one can take. And, and the experience, you know, seeing my son fighting for his life, effectively, multiple times in, in three months, uh, you know, and you know, spending time in a in a pediatric ICU is an experience that I don't recommend don't to that. anyone. Yeah. I don't wish right. to anyone in the world, even if it's not your son or your or your uh, uh, right. daughter. Uh, just you know, seeing kids connected to so many cables is just something that nobody should ever see. Mm. Um, but it really did uh, solidify the idea that you know what, yes, open sourcing financial service is a big challenge, but is it, uh, you right. know, compared to, you know, what I've seen my son go through and come out, you know, with lifelong issues, uh, but here and happy and smiling. And so I think, I think that's been, you know, when we talk about, uh, maybe if we touch on, on how we build community and how you do actually, uh, have to have an element of sort of empathy uh, in in you know everything you do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that was one of the most teaching moments for me. Um, yes, it, it's amazing they were able to pivot, um, but you know, it's not. It can be only work, as we were saying before. Like, yeah, uh, there's there's worthier and worthier challenges that I think. Uh, should put in perspective, you know, when someone feels down or where your boss doesn't treat you well, mm-hmm. but, you know, uh, as we've seen, for example, in this pandemic, there's always much worse. Uh, yeah. So to be, you know, very, very, uh, but I think consider ourselves very lucky. Agreed. Agreed on that in many different ways. Um, thanks for that, by the way. Um, uh, you know, I, I kind of we talked a little bit beforehand, but um, but I feel like you know sometimes knowing knowing what I, I told you that I do another uh, podcast that's uh, personal and it's on leadership and mindset and things like that. Let's and plug. huh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, uh, it's not mine. It's a friend of mine. Um, but you know, but having the interpersonal stories that you know, lead to what is happening around somebody is to me very important. Um, it, it's, it's what, you know, it's what biographies are built around. It, it's, um, you know, you, you can't have success without challenges. Otherwise it's just, you know, flying through life blissfully. Um, so, so sometimes those struggles that we have personally, interpersonally, you know, really, push us for something more and sometimes we put that into whatever that personal thing is sometimes we put that into whatever our work is and and you're right um you know i go back to you know my time in the infantry in the army at fort bragg and you know i had it a lot easier than some people obviously um while i was there but i look at it as there's some crap that i never want to go through again um, and so that always that has always made everything else that I do after that easier for right. you it's going through things with Leo and Christine and then you know everything after that is you know it's just work it's just you know it's something else 
Um, so that is, that's probably more important. Oh, it is more important than, you know, what we do on a daily basis within the foundation. But, um, but I think it does kind of, it helps your focus on, on, you know, what's important. It helps my focus on what's important um, and, and how we go about that too. I hope. Right. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And again, I think we've seen, um, you know, we went through a pretty, pretty hard year. Um, mm -hmm. year and, yeah. Um, you know, I think in a way, having had to go through these challenges uh, made it, you know, much easier for me to, you know, try at least to help balance uh, mm -hmm. not only my life, but really making sure uh, that I understood uh, the challenges that, that my employees were going through and, and our community. And mm -hmm. look, you know, you said going through life blissfully. That had been pretty much the story of my life. Until yeah. And, you know, I've yeah. always been relatively healthy. My parents stuck together. Um, you know, I, I've had the luck of being able to study and, and have always a pretty successful career. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a wonderful wife, which, uh, you know, teaches me things every day. And, and, and uh, you know, it's really a, uh, a beam that I follow, uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, my North Star. And, you know, it would have been much harder to relate to, you know, the challenges that everyone has gone through in the last year. Uh, you know, hadn't I had my own challenges to deal with. So, you know, you're absolutely spot on. Um, I think, you know, like in, as you say, any book or any movie, mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, there's something to be said around, you know, what you learn, uh, um, again, and how you apply these learnings in all you do. Uh, in all right. The different right. Well, you know what, I think we should probably stop there honestly and and um and then let's let's do another one and look um as some you know topics i wanted to get to about you know what does finos do what is the end goal what you know how does that affect you know different members and companies and then down to developers and end users let let's do that um you know again i think that you know, you know, this was great. Um, thank you. Um, but let's, uh, let's save that for maybe a part two. Um, and, uh, revisit this, uh, shortly. Um, if that's cool with you. Love the teaser. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, uh, to close out, uh, thank you all for, um, uh, listening to this podcast, the open source in fintech podcast. I didn't say meet up that time. So I'm very happy with myself. Um, uh, please look out and subscribe to our Open Source Fintech podcast, this, uh, our bi-weekly, and I say every single time, uh, every two weeks, not twice a week, um, our bi-weekly newsletter, um, our weekly this week at Finos email, follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn, join the Finos Slack channels, um, and I'll put those in the show notes for this. Uh, if you have any questions about events or the podcast, uh, email us at events at finos.org. If you have any questions about how to get involved in the Finos community in any way, please reach out to us at info at finos.org. Or uh, again, we have the Finos Slack channels that you can reach out directly to Gab, to myself, to uh, James, who's the director of community, to Tasha, who's our COO, Aitana, who uh, deals with a lot of um, reg tech, and um, Al, who's in charge of uh, member success, Mal, who's another Italian and one of your best friends, um, uh, who's uh, our CTO or something around there. He's our tech guy. Um, did I miss anybody? I always forget. Um, and uh, just reach out to us, get involved with the community, um, and we'd love to have you. So uh, thank you. Uh, good day, good night, wherever you are. Thank you, Grizz. Thank you. Um, all right. So we're going to start in three, two, one. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And welcome to the Finos Open Source and FinTech Meetup. Crap. <laughs>
I'm gonna start over. <laughs> Can just read my own crap. Podcast. I'm gonna leave that in there. Who knows? So let me try one more time. Take two. Oh, my God.